So if you've been watching the news, listening to the news, reading the news at all, then you have been inundated with Nancy Pelosi's January 6th committee. This is obviously Pelosi's partisan attempt to keep this story alive um, when no one else in the country cares about it. But if you're on the conservative side, then one of the stories that you've been inundated with is the fact that Congresswoman Liz Cheney and Congressman Adam Kinzinger, two Republicans in name only, are seated on Pelosi's committee. Now, the reason Cheney and Kinzinger are on Pelosi's committee is that Pelosi rejected uh, Kevin McCarthy, his choices for which Congress members were going to be seated on this committee. Then McCarthy, in response, withdrew all of his suggestions if he wasn't going to be allowed to actually pick. And Pelosi continued this uh, partisan ploy herself, picking two of the most anti-Trump, never-Trump, rhino Republicans possible to sit on the committee. And if you don't like curse words, which I don't, I try not to use them. I'm not very good at cursing, but there's really no other word to describe Cheney's and Kinzinger's narrative other than their narratives are absolute utter bullshit. And here's what I mean. So shortly after January 6th happened, Congresswoman Cheney said, and this is a quote, today we face a threat America has never seen before. A former president who provoked a violent attack on this Capitol in an effort to steal the election, has resumed his aggressive effort to convince Americans that the election was stolen from him, he risks inciting further violence, end quote. She said at a different time about January 6th, she said, the president of the United States summoned this mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack, end quote. Now, if that sounds like warmonger language to you, I don't know what to tell you. There's a little irony there, a Cheney using this kind of language. Um, when she was seated on Pelosi's committee, this is what she said in response. She said, Congress is obligated to conduct a full investigation of the most serious attack on our Capitol since 1814, end quote. So I'm not exactly sure um, what she's talking about. She must not be talking about this January 6th committee because January 6th was not even kind of close to the most serious attack on our Capitol since 1814. So maybe, maybe she's talking about 9-11, September 11th, 2001, when radical Islamist jihadis attacked the Pentagon and attempted to attack the Capitol. Maybe that's what Cheney's talking about. Maybe she's talking about Black Lives Matter riots in 2020. You know, Black Lives Matter riots where 30 people across the country died during this violence, where innumerable livelihoods, life savings, and businesses were ruined at the hands of a greedy mob who burned these buildings, broke glass, stole from innocent American business owners under the guise of what? Social justice, racial justice? The financial cost of the damage accrued from the Black Lives Matter riots is more than 60 times the amount of money it's gonna cost to repair the Capitol in the wake of January 6th. Maybe Congresswoman Cheney's talking about that. Or maybe she's talking about the 1983 bombing of the Senate by radical leftists. Or perhaps she's talking about the 1954 raid by Puerto Rican nationalists who shot five members of Congress. Shot them. But no, Congresswoman Cheney is ridiculous. She's playing an absolute fool to Pelosi here. And she's she was referring to January 6th, the absolute absurdity. And we'll get to why it's so absurd in a moment. But first, we have to remember... Congressman Kinzinger. Congressman King Kinzinger said, and I quote, on January 6th, 2021, the President of the United States encouraged an angry mob to storm the United States Capitol to stop the counting of electoral votes. So a lot of people who watch the mainstream media hear narratives like this from Kinzinger and Cheney and all the Democrats and all of the leftists, by the way, in the mainstream media, and they don't know what Trump actually said because the mainstream media, you will notice, doesn't actually report what Trump said. Now, I have to admit, there were times during the Trump presidency when Trump would use an indelicate turn of phrase, and watching it could be partially entertaining because it was generally funny, but also partially frustrating from a PR standpoint because I'd sit back there and think, well, sure, that's funny, but you know the mainstream media is going to take that out of context. You know the Democrats are going to twist that in, you know, into an attack against you. You know that you know, you're setting a narrative that's not helpful to the Republican Party just by maybe not thinking fully before you choose a certain word or phrase. There were times during the Trump presidency that I think we all felt that. But what he said on January 6th is not included. What he said on Jan what President Trump said on January 6th was not problematic. 
This is the exact quote. Again, most people don't know the exact quote because the mainstream media never repeats it, which is an admission by omission that it wasn't problematic. Here's what he said. He said, I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. How could that possibly be misconstrued? Marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Literally, what, what part of that sparked an insurrection, encouraged violence? Well, if you ask the left, they ignore that part of President Trump's remarks and instead point to this phrase that he said in, the, in his speech as well on January 6th. He said, we fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Well, first of all, he's right. If we don't fight against the radical leftist agenda, we are not going to have our country as we know it and love it anymore. That's almost inarguable. Even the left doesn't claim to want our country as it is anymore. They are trying to fundamentally change it. Listen, nobody on earth actually believes that the phrase, we fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore, means, hey, why don't you go inside an insurrection? This is a colloquial term that anyone with a brain knows is a phrase. It is just a phrase, we fight like hell. It doesn't mean physically fighting. It's not an encouragement or an incitement to an insurrection. This is perhaps the lamest attempt from the Democrats that I've ever seen to accuse a Republican of something that they didn't do. And the, the Democrats, by the way, obviously do this all the time. They accuse us of being racist. They accuse us of being sexist and misogynistic and homophobic and transphobic and all these other isms and ias that they falsely attribute to our policy positions. But this might be the absolute dumbest one because no one, in, no, literally no one, thinks we fight like hell means please go violently attack someone else. This was and always, this is and was always a ploy by the Democrats to just to impeach President Trump because they wanted to impeach President Trump because they couldn't meet him in the court of public opinion because his policies were popular with the American people who the Democrats for eight years under Barack Obama had let down with their policies. So they couldn't go toe to toe with Trump and say, we're honest and we want the best for you and here's how we're going to accomplish it. Because not only were people better off under President Trump than they were under Barack Obama, they liked what President Trump was doing, and the Democrats were just offering more of the same, more of what hurt the American people. So essentially what Cheney and Kinzinger are doing by sitting on Pelosi's partisan committee is they're buying into this radical leftist web of lies, this web of lies that embraces Marxism, that embraces a Marxist narrative that words are actual violence. And like I said, it's actually even dumber than that because first of all, words can't be actual violence no matter what you say. But even if you parse the particular specific words President Trump spoke to that crowd on January 6th before people went over to the Capitol, you couldn't possibly bridge that gap between what he said and what happened. But Cheney and Kinzinger apparently are dumb enough that they're willing to play puppets to Nancy Pelosi. Here's the other thing. So one of the um, foundational parts, I guess, of Cheney's problems with President Trump is his claims that the election was stolen. Now, I just did an episode on this. So if you want to hear my breakdown of um, what I believe happened in the election and what we have learned about voter fraud in the state of Georgia and Arizona from the audits and what I think about the claims that the election was stolen versus having hard proof versus um, the left's claims that there was nothing wrong that happened at all, please go listen to that episode. Um, it's called The Election Audits That You've Been Dying to Hear About. But here's my question to Congresswoman Cheney. How do you justify the claim that President Trump is telling this, what she calls this big lie, that there was voter fraud in the election? Of course, President Trump claims that voter fraud was extensive enough that it cost him the election. He claims that Biden didn't truly win fairly, that voter fraud gave him enough votes to supersede the number of votes that President Trump got. But how does Cheney justify the claim that there was no voter fraud, given what we've recently learned in Georgia and Arizona? There was voter fraud. That part is inarguable. Now, there is an argument to be made that we don't yet have the hard proof, the hard data to know the full extent of the voter fraud in Georgia and Arizona, and that's what we've, I mean, almost everyone agrees with that. 
even the people conducting the audit say, well, in the months to come, we're going to learn more about the exact numbers. If there's more than 10,000 people in Georgia who were not voting in the proper county, therefore their votes were ineligible, we all know that there's not a full accounting of the extent of the fraud that happened in the 2020 presidential election. But to pretend that there wasn't any fraud, I mean, it's almost laughable because it's inarguable that there was fraud. There's always fraud. It's just the, the, the question is, to what extent? And was it to the extent that it cost President Trump the election? So again, to Cheney, how do you justify claiming that President Trump's concern about voter fraud led to violence, especially after what we've learned in Georgia and Arizona? So the other part, the other problem here, the other obvious telltale sign or tell, poker tell, from Pelosi's committee that this is just a partisan endeavor to try to keep the narrative about President Trump, even though he's not in the White House anymore, is the fact that the Democrats don't care at all about the violence, the actual violence that happened during the Black Lives Matter riots. Now, the left is going to accuse me right now of engaging in whataboutism, but it's not. This is not whataboutism because there's been violence that was allowed based on a partisan basis. So if a particular form of violence was allowed based on a partisan basis and another type of violence or another situation of violence was disallowed based on a partisan basis, that's certainly a discussion that needs to be had, not because of whataboutism, because that's two sets of rules applied to people differently based on their political views. That's not equality under the law. If you as... Um, a Republican are treated differently than you as a Democrat under the law, that's unjust. That's not fair. That's not equality under the law. And that's, that's what we've seen here. So the Black Lives Matter riots, businesses were destroyed. There's tons of videos of looters. I mean, how can you possibly justify stealing shoes, stealing purses, in the name of racial justice, how on earth does that help black lives? How are you standing up from black, for black lives when you're stealing jewelry? The flames coming from these businesses, I mean, the cities were on fire. And there's been the accountability for all of this? None. None. And no Democrat is calling for accountability either. Yet when a few loony Trump supporters on January 6th, not the entire crowd, not the entire rally, broke windows and engaged in behavior that we all wish they had not engaged in. That's an insurrection. That's the worst attack on the Capitol since 1814. As I said at the beginning, BS. Absolute BS. This is a partisan agenda. Not to mention the questions that still exist about what actually did happen on January 6th. I mean, forgive me for being a skeptic here, but I'm sorry if I'm skeptical of the narrative coming from the mainstream media when the mainstream media lies to us. I'm also skeptical of um, plots, if you will, given what we recently learned about the FBI planning the plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. We were told that was conservatives. We were told that was lockdown skeptics. We were told that was, you know, Republicans, anti-science Republicans who just want to be vigilantes. Well, it turns out that plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. The ringleader was the FBI. The FBI paid these nutsos to get together and plan and execute this plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer. Without the FBI, it probably wouldn't have happened. This was the ringleader. So forgive me if I'm skeptical about the mainstream media and the Democrats' claims about what happened on January 6th. The mainstream media coverage of January 6th from the moment that it happened has been almost entirely inaccurate. So again, going back to Congresswoman Cheney, to Congressman Kinzinger, why participate in Pelosi's in Pelosi's little game here? I only see two options. Why? Because this isn't a rhetorical question. It's either to boost your ego and maybe you think your fame, maybe you think you're going to get a CNN contributorship from it. Who knows? Or are you that naive of Nancy Pelosi's radical agenda and how she carries it out? I see no other option besides those two options about why Cheney and Kinzinger would participate in this. With all due respect, they're absolute fools for doing this. So a recent Rasmussen poll shows that the American people themselves actually want the Black Lives Matter riots investigated 
um, more Americans want the Black Lives Matter riots investigated than the January 6th riots. 66% of people who were asked want the Black Lives Matter riots to be investigated, while only 49% support Pelosi's partisan endeavor, uh, her January 6th commission. Funny, you probably won't hear that from the mainstream media as, uh, as they're airing Cheney and Kinzinger's grievances. And you'll notice probably the mainstream media, I fully expect, please heed this prediction, I fully expect the mainstream media will primarily show clips of Cheney and Kinzinger. They won't show the Democrats. They will use these Republican in name only members of Congress to make it seem like it's bipartisan. It's not. So on the first day of this hearing, one of the Capitol Police officers who was testifying said that even if people, the people on that day had been armed with pens, not guns, not knives, not typical weapons, even if the people had been armed with only pens, writing utensils, that still would have been an insurrection, he said. Okay, if that's the standard, let's play by your rules for a second. What about the protesters, the radical leftist protesters, the feminist protesters, the pro-abortion protesters during the Kavanaugh hearings, who screamed in the Senate, who actually stormed the Senate building, who pounded on the doors of the Supreme Court? Is that an insurrection? Well, if not, why not? using your standards. I'm Liz Wheeler, welcome to The Liz Wheeler Show. If Nancy Pelosi and the Republicans in name only who are on her January 6th committee actually wanted to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th, then they would ask a series of very specific questions and I'll get to that in just a second, but first, Speaking of asking questions, here's a question for you. Why aren't you using Nutrafol? If you want thicker, healthier hair, then let's talk about Nutrafol. Nutrafol is a holistic solution to your problem with little hair. It is non-pharmaceutical. It has been shown in clinical studies to work at three and six months after men have begun to take uh, Nutrafol. It's why 1,500 doctors across the country endorse Nutrafol as a solution to your hair problems. And here's the part um, that might actually catch your attention. Most of these hair products lower your sex drive. This one doesn't. This one does not, and that is why it is different. So let me tell you, you can grow thicker, healthier hair, and you can support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code Liz to save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code Liz. Please remember the promo code Liz. That is how you support our show. Nutrafol.com, promo code Liz. That is if you want thicker, healthier hair. If not, I don't know, go there anyway. Nutrafol.com. Okay, American Greatness published a list of questions that Nancy Pelosi, if she had even an iota of integrity, which we know she doesn't, if she had an iota of integrity and an ounce of curiosity about what actually happened on January 6th, these are some of the questions that her committee would investigate. Again, these questions are from American Greatness. Why were requests made by the US Capitol Police, a federal agency under the purview of Congress, for extra security ahead of January 6th denied? It's interesting, isn't it? Denied. Requests for extra security were denied. Why were those requests denied? That's a question that should be answered. Who seeded the lie that Brian Sicknick was killed in the line of duty? And who told the New York Times he was murdered by a Trump mob with a fire extinguisher? Well, we know that turned out to be a complete lie. Who is responsible for that? And why doesn't Nancy Pelosi want to know if she's so interested in fake news? Remember the Biden administration says that misinformation and disinformation kills people. Well, if it, that's true, operating again by their standards, then we should be asking this. We should want to know because that's disinformation. Misinformation, fake news, actual violence by the Democrat standards. American Greatness then goes on, did any FBI agents or informants infiltrate groups such as the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and Three Percenters before January 6th? 
Ooh, this is a good question based on what I said before, based on the fact that the FBI, essentially the ringleader of the plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, that was blamed on conservatives and government-mandated lockdown skeptics. What was the FBI's role in January 6th? Were they informants? Were they organizers? Like the FBI plot to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer? If Pelosi had any interest in the truth, she would ask this question. She would also ask, who were the officers caught on tape allowing protesters into the building? We can see that for ourselves. Some of the officers did let people in. They didn't break down the doors. They were allowed in. So who were they? And specifically, from American Greatness, who opened the doors on the Upper West Terrace at approximately 2.30 p.m. at the direction of an unknown U.S. CP officer? We should know that. It makes a pretty big difference in the narrative. How much damage did the building sustain? The architect of the Capitol originally claimed 30 million in damages, but in court filings, the government claims the building only sustained about 1.5 million in damages. Well, that's not even close, 1.5 million or 30 million. But it does make a difference to the Democrat narrative. If Pelosi was interested in the truth, she would ask that. Another question from American Greatness. On January 7th, Pelosi called the Capitol riot a, quote, armed insurrection. How many people have been charged with carrying a firearm into the building? You'd think she'd want to answer that question since she's the one who called it an armed insurrection. How many Americans remain incarcerated under pretrial detention orders awaiting delayed trials that won't start until next year? Are there reports of mental and physical abuse of January 6th detainees by DC prison guards, including solitary confinement conditions for months on end and lack of access to defense lawyers? I mean, regardless of the crimes committed, we should want answers to that question because that's wrong no matter what you did. Then, they, then uh, from American Greatness, should social media companies, including Facebook and Twitter, be criminally charged for allowing protesters to organize the insurrection on their platform? That is a great question. And that would um, implicate so many leftists. It would implicate not only big tech, but Amazon. Because remember Parler. Parler was the subject of an accusation that insurrectionists plotted on their platforms. Well, it turns out Parler had made FBI reports about violence being plotted on their platform. And Facebook, where more violence was plotted, more conversations happened compared to Parler, Facebook made no such reports. American Greatness asks, who are the anonymous proud members of the United States Capitol Police threatening to withhold security from members of Congress who did not support a commission? That is dangerous stuff. Imagine, imagine if you were a Congress member of either party, reliant on these Capitol Police officers for your safety, yet you didn't know if this individual who was supposedly sworn, who had supposedly sworn to protect your life actually wasn't going to protect you because they disagreed with your politics. We absolutely need to know that. And finally, who shot and killed Ashley Babbitt? Why hasn't that name been released? This is an interesting, that, that, I mean, it's so strange because if there's a shooting of an unarmed black man, it's two minutes before the name of the police officer is released. Usually, that police officer's life, certainly their reputation and their job are completely ruined, even if they are acquitted or exonerated. And yet, we're not entitled to know who killed this civilian? If Pelosi had any interest in the truth, she would ask these questions. My question, of course, that I would add to this is during this testimony from Capitol Hill police officers, again, what about the police officers who have been attacked across the country by Antifa and Black Lives Matter? Are we going to set up a commission to hear from them? Not what about ism, a separate standard of justice based on your political affiliation. If we, the people, don't speak out against that, then President Trump was right. We will cease to know our country. Our country will cease to be what it is today. So an absolutely nuts video that, by the way, I don't want to pat myself on the back too hard, but this completely proves that I was right in my conversation with Mark Lamont Hill. So you might remember, I went on Mark Lamont Hill's show just a couple of weeks ago to debate critical race theory and what he calls whiteness. Um, and I said, well, when you want to understand, if you want to understand critical race theory, you have to trace it back to its roots. You have to first trace it back to critical legal studies because critical legal studies is sort of the father of critical race theory. And then you have to trace it even further back to critical theory, which is the grandfather of critical race theory. So critical theory is just a Marxist theory. 
It was penned, this manifesto on critical theory was penned at the Frankfurt School by Max Horkheimer, a known Marxist, admitted Marxist. Critical theory is a tactic, it's a tool that Marxists wanted to use in the West to undermine Western institutions in order to implement Marxism. So when I said this, Mark Lamont Hill denied this. He acted like I didn't want to discuss critical race theory itself. because Instead, I wanted to obscure the reality of what it was um, by claiming that it was Marxism. He claims it's just a perspective on history and a prism through which to look at American laws. We know that that's not true, but... Um, and you can take my word for it because I showed all the history, but then it's even more fun when this happens. The founder of critical race theory, her name is Kimberly Crenshaw. She is the one who coined the term critical race theory. She actually admits that critical race theory is an offshoot of critical theory. And here's what happened. Let's walk through this. So first I talked to Mark Lamont Hill, right? Then AOC goes on CNN, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, goes on CNN and accuses the Republicans. I mean, these are the most debunked talking points. She must think that the people listening to her are absolute idiots if they're to think that they would believe what she's saying. She accuses Republicans of using critical race theory as a proxy for not wanting to talk about race in schools at all. Take a look at this. So, Congresswoman, I want to ask you about this debate that we're seeing over critical race theory. Do you think Republican efforts to redefine it and use it as a scare tactic, do you think it's working? Well, I do think it's working because what we have seen is that the Republican base and the Republican Party has really pivoted to a strategy of using race and using just the changing demographics of this country. Um, and as we saw on January 6th, using a, a white supremacist core logic in order to reanimate a very core fear in this country of the other. And so what's really important is that we come together and have a very strong rebuttal to that core logic, not just in fact-checking Republican claims, but actually confronting the core logic and addressing the core fears that they are trying to really tap into when they try to use terms like critical race theory um, as a proxy for just saying, talking about race in schools in general. So she's repeating the same talking point of Mark Lamont Hill. This is a perspective on history. This is just a way of looking. This is just a way of looking at laws. This is just about talking. This is just talking about race in schools. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Again, you don't have to take my word for it, AOC. Why don't you listen to the founder of critical race theory herself, Kimberly Crenshaw. Take a listen to this. So um, let me start with Mari Matsuda. So um, Mari is, uh, she used the word herself, a CRT and intersectionality OG. She was a posse member from the very beginning. She was there in the days before we even called ourselves critical race theorists. Um, she literally staged with several of us a protest at the very seat of elite legal education. That galvanized a set of events in the 80s, um, namely the student of color-led boycott against Harvard Law School's refusal to recruit scholars of color, saying that there were none in the country who were qualified to come there and teach, and a refusal to teach Derek Bell's courses. That was just after the first time Derek left Harvard Law School. Um, and these refusals led to our eventual self-declaration as an offshoot of critical legal studies. We discovered ourselves to be critical theorists who did race, and we were racial justice advocates who did critical theory. So Mari was one of the very few who knew the truth when in 1987, I sent out a call to attend a retreat called New Developments in Critical Race Theory. Only she, Neil Gatanda, Chuck Lawrence, and maybe a handful of other people knew that there were no new developments in critical race theory because CRT hadn't had any old ones. It didn't exist. It was made up as a name. Sometimes you got to fake it until you make it. We discovered ourselves to be critical theorists who did race. Critical theorists who did race. 
her first seminar, Kimberly Crenshaw's first seminar on critical race theory, she describes as fake it till you make it. Critical theorists who did race. Well, well, well. How do you like that? Look at who was correct by peeling back the layers of history. I told Mark Lamont Hill that critical race theory is Marxism. He came back and asked me, well, what critical race theory adherent or scholar admits that they want to spark a Marxist revolution? Well, here you have it. Kimberly Crenshaw says they're critical theorists who do race. Critical theorists are Marxists. Critical theory is a tactic to spark a Marxist revolution by tearing down institutions, Western institutions, which is what we see in this country. We see these radical leftists who adhere to critical race theory, using race to try to tear down our criminal justice system, to try to tear down our government, to try to tear down the nuclear family and traditional marriage, these tenants that underpin our moral society, the free market, they wanna abolish capitalism. They wanna abolish gender. All of these institutions that form our foundation through critical, constant criticism, relentless criticism, they call it. They wanna use racial minorities to break these institutions. Why? To implement Marxism. So there you have it. That's the scholar, the critical race theory scholar who admitted that critical race theory is just Marxist. Okay, speaking of what you search for on the computer. Speaking of what you search for on the computer, let's talk about ExpressVPN. So when you're conducting a Google search, when you pick up your phone and you're searching for whatever you search for, I search for about 100 things every day. Your internet service providers creeping on what you do. They're looking at every single thing that you search for, collecting your history, compiling your data. And as if that's not creepy enough, they're then selling your data. Every single website that you've ever visited, they're selling to ad companies. Do you want that? Is that what you want for your family when your children are searching for things? Do you want your internet service provider creeping on them? Well, if not, then you should try ExpressVPN. It's, I, I never go online without using ExpressVPN, even when I'm at home, because it's so creepy. ExpressVPN is very easy to use. It's an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so that your internet service provider cannot see the sites that you visit. They keep all your information secure by encrypting all of your data, all you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. So protect your online activity today. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Liz, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash Liz, expressvpn.com slash Liz to learn more. So I've been saying over the past month, especially in the wake of these renewed mask mandates, that the American people need to just stop complying. We have to stop complying. If we continue to comply, the government in its entirety, whether that's local health, local public health officials, whether that's state representatives and governors, whether that's the federal government and the CDC, they're not going to stop their power grab as long as we're complying. And so we should stop complying, especially with mask mandates. I've said this a hundred times and I'm gonna keep repeating it and until mask mandates have been completely obliterated and never again. In fact, people, Republicans, conservatives, and independent-minded people should be pressuring their state representatives to ban the ability or the power that state governments have and localities have of actually mandating masks. Our politicians shouldn't have that power. Um, and if enough of us refuse to comply, by the way, then there's gonna be no way for it to be enforced. So it starts with us at multiple levels. Now, I wanna give credit where credit is due, mostly because this just made me laugh, but whenever there's somebody who puts something on the line to fight back, risks losing something, risks alienating part of their business, um, whatever it may be, whether it's personal risk, whether it's political risk, whenever someone actually fights back for what's right, I wanna give them credit where credit's due. So there's this restaurant in Huntington Beach in California. We know how nutty California is. And this restaurant in Huntington Beach has a sign hanging in the front of their establishment that says that they require proof that customers are not vaccinated. Now, like I said, this is the most absolute hilarious troll. This was noticed originally reported by Billy Binion. He's the assistant editor at Reason Magazine. This is the photo that he tweeted out of this restaurant. 
And the notice says, for those who are not watching, for those who are listening, it says, notice, proof of being unvaccinated required. We have zero tolerance for treasonous anti-American stupidity. Thank you for pondering. I think this is so funny. I don't know how it's gonna affect their business. I hope um, I hope people flock to their store. I hope this is great. Again, I don't care if you chose of your own free will to get the vaccine. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. If you want it, I'm happy that you have the opportunity to get it. What I have a problem with is either government mandating it, government coercing people, government officials talking about going door to door to try to pressure us into getting a vaccine that we don't want, or government influencing the private sector to implement these quasi-mandates that you can't go into a venue without it. You can't go to work without it. God forbid you can't fly without it. Those are quasi-mandates, and make no mistake, government officials do pressure private industry to take part in these quasi-mandates. So that's what I have a problem with, just so that it's not misconstrued here. And whenever someone fights back, I want to give them the kudos they deserve. So kudos to this restaurant. Um, Also, let's talk for a second about non pharmaceutical interventions. These are called NPIs in scientific jargon. And I talked about this very much at the beginning of the pandemic. This time last year, there was already evidence that lockdowns were devastating, not just to people's businesses and livelihoods and life savings, which is very important because that's how we sustain ourselves and support our families, but that it was detrimental to people's health. We saw the mental health crisis that happened because of these lockdowns. We saw suicide uh, hotlines the calls, just the number of calls just skyrocket. We saw medical care and surgeries canceled and denied. Well, a new study out of Britain, out of the UK, found that children were impacted by this in a horrendous way. In the UK, between the dates of March 2020 and February of 2021, essentially the year of COVID, the first year of COVID, five times more children died from suicide then died from COVID-19 in Britain. 25 children total died of COVID during that time period, 25. But during that same time period, 124 children died of suicide. Now, was every one of those suicides related to the lockdowns? No, and I don't think anybody's making that claim. But were some of them? Yes. Compared to 25 children who died from COVID-19. Each and every life lost is a tragedy. No one is denying that. But this is clearly not a virus that is high risk to children. And yet, infringing on their fundamental rights and locking them down, quarantining them, depriving them of their normal lives led to a mental health crisis that led to five times more children dying of suicide than COVID-19 in Britain during that time period. This is a preprint study, by the way. It was conducted by researchers from the University of Bristol, University of York, University of Liverpool, and University College London. This is a legit study. It's in the peer review process right now. Horrible. I mean, it makes me sad just thinking about it. Thinking of a kid who feels so desolate, who feels so abandoned, so isolated, so alone, so fearful, based on this false narrative the media and politicians have given us about COVID-19 that they would take their own life. Cancer sufferers in the UK have similarly been completely abandoned by the government who claims to be there for them. Now, I, I think it's important. I like to talk about stories of health outcomes in Britain's socialized healthcare system because Britain has a socialized healthcare system. And if a prosperous, westernized nation like Britain suffers these shortages and control control by the government, this um, rationing of healthcare and this shoddy quality of care, then you bet that would happen here if we ever allowed our government to nationalize our healthcare system. So in the UK, there are about 4.2 million people who have cancer and they're on waiting lists, NHS waiting lists that uh, for treatment for their cancer. Now, in the UK, it's always been a horrific amount of time under their socialized healthcare system to get care if you have cancer. The average wait time used to be 22 weeks. And I remember 
actually talking about this story because 22 weeks is months. So if you have a significant cancer, if this is if this is anything that could be fatal or could develop into being fatal, waiting 22 weeks before you get treatment once you discover it could escalate this. You could die by waiting 22 weeks, whereas if you had addressed it closer to immediately, you might have a higher success rate of your treatment. You have a, might have a better chance of actually living, of surviving this. I literally remember talking about that part of the story before the pandemic. Well, now, thanks to the government lockdowns, the government canceling healthcare, in the UK, these 4 million people who are on wait lists previously expected to wait 22 weeks. Now, they're expected to wait 37 weeks. Imagine sitting in the waiting room, waiting for the doctor to call you back. You go back into the doctor's office and you're told you have a really serious form of lung cancer. You need to start treatment immediately so that, you're, so that you have a chance of survival, so that your family doesn't lose their mom, your family doesn't lose your dad. What would you expect to do? You'd expect to start treatment as soon as possible, really, really soon. In the UK, you have to wait 37 weeks. 37 weeks thanks to the government-mandated lockdowns. If that's not horrifying, I don't know what is. I don't know what, how they could possibly excuse this. I don't know how anybody can possibly consider the British healthcare system to be taking care of, peri- of people based on that. Meanwhile, here in the United States, California Governor Gavin Newsom, who broke his own quarantine Um, mandates to dine at the French Laundry with his elite friends who I guess were so leftist and so elite that, you know, they they weren't at risk from the virus. Funny how Black Lives Matter protesters and rich Democrat elitists, they getting together in groups, that's not a threat to public health. No, no. Um, So Newsom on CNN compared unvaccinated people in his state to drunk drivers. Take a listen to this. So let's talk about masks. Of course, L.A. County has uh, brought back their mask mandate uh, for indoors, regardless of vaccination status. I want to put up on the screen uh, the growth in cases. Uh, I've got the six weeks before uh, the indoor mask mandate for vaccinated people ended on June 15th. And then you see the six weeks or so since. And there, of course, is this growth in cases. Is it time, Governor, to bring back a universal mask mandate Uh, regardless of vaccination status there in California? Look, we don't even have to have that debate if we can just get everybody vaccinated that's not vaccinated, that's refusing to get vaccinated, that's living uh, vaccine free and impacting the rest of us. It's like drunk drivers. You don't have the right to go out and drink and drive and put everybody else at risk, including your own life at risk. So first of all, remember, as always, cases and case counts mean absolutely nothing in our country right now because of the cycle thresholds of the PCR tests. Absolutely nothing. You could test positive while actively sick. You could test positive while asymptomatic. You could test positive two months down the road after an asymptomatic bout. It means nothing because the cycle thresholds are so high, they find these tiny little fragments of the virus, which doesn't really mean that you were ever a clinical case. So keep that in mind when Gavin Newsom uses case counts, positive tests as justification for being an authoritarian. Case counts mean nothing. Here's the second thing. If we can get everybody vaccinated was his phrase. If we can get everybody vaccinated. Well, here's my question, which is it? Can the Delta variant blow through the vaccine or not? I'd love to have that answer from somebody like Gavin Newsom, a public health official or a politician who's using the number or the percentage of people who don't want the vaccine as justification for being a tyrant. The drunk driving metaphor, I've debunked before, and I will do it again. It is not the same, because if you are driving drunk, you have previously made an active decision to imbibe. You have previously made an active decision to be overserved, to impair yourself with alcohol. Once you have made that active decision to impair yourself, no, you're not allowed to drive a motor vehicle, because that might hurt somebody. That is not the same as the choice not to get vaccinated. The choice not to get vaccinated is You've made no choices. You could be sitting on your front porch. You could be watching TV in your house. You have, it's completely passive. There's no active choice involved. So just by nature of sitting there, Gavin Newsom has dubbed you a threat, a public health risk. 
essentially accusing you of homicide if you don't. That's not the same at all as drunk driving, which requires you to make a bad decision first and then limit your actions following the bad decision so that you don't hurt somebody. With a vaccine, you've made no such decision. And so, again, but using their standards. I like, I like to defeat Democrat arguments using their standards because almost always their standards are flawed. Here's my question based on their standards. If you get the COVID-19 vaccine and then you spread the Delta variant, because we know the Delta variant is spread even through people who have been vaccinated. If you get the vaccine and then spread the Delta variant, is that the same as a DUI? Because it seems, according to Gavin Newsom's standards, that it would be, I'd really like him to address that so that we know whether people who unknowingly pass the virus are murderers or not, maybe getting the vaccine isn't really what he said it is. Okay, Biden's Department of Justice has dropped the investigation into nursing home COVID deaths in the state of New York and two other states. Now, this is very disappointing, but it's very unsurprising because the Biden Department of Justice is a joke. They're not interested in pursuing justice. They are a political apparatus who operates under the same agenda as the radical leftist Biden administration. This is just more proof. The fact that Biden's Department of Justice dropped this investigation, it's more proof that the Democrats don't actually care about people's lives. They don't actually care about protecting people against COVID. Because if they did, then they'd be very interested in Cuomo aides, for example, who pressured officials in the state health department to actually falsify a report. Falsify a report by omission to remove the total number of nursing home residents who had died from COVID-19. They deliberately covered this up in order to cover for Governor Cuomo in New York because he had mandated that nursing homes in his state allow, he had mandated that they allow positive testing COVID-19 patients back from the hospital into the nursing home, even though coronaviruses, not just COVID-19, but coronaviruses in general are a death knell in nursing homes. They spread like wildfire in nursing homes. And we have a particularly virulent strain of one. Nursing homes want to protect their other residents and Cuomo, by the power of law, forced them to allow positive patients in their nursing homes and then covered it up and lied about it if Democrats cared about people's lives, protecting them from COVID-19, they wouldn't be talking about fully vaccinated people wearing masks inside. They'd be talking about this. They'd be talking about the state of New York. They'd be talking about Cuomo and his mandate and his cover-up and how many thousands of grandmothers and grandfathers died because of Cuomo's political actions. And you won't hear a word from Democrats. The U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled last week, I think it was Friday, that the state of California unconstitutionally violated the right of families um, by forcing private schools to close down in 2020 during the government-mandated lockdowns. The judge's name is Judge Daniel Collins, and this is what he said. California's forced closure of their private schools implicates a right that has long been considered fundamental under the applicable case law, the right of parents to control their children's education and to choose their children's educational form, end quote. This is a great win, and I'm happy about this, but this is also, it should be a no-brainer in our society. Of course, private schools should not have had to close based on the government mandate. These government officials have way too much power. It's up to us, again, we the people, to curb the power that they have. They shouldn't have these emergency powers. And we should force state legislatures to rescind these emergency powers so they can never do this again. Now, the next COVID study that I want to talk about. It's absolutely crazy. It obliterates the left's narrative on COVID and the COVID vaccine. And it also implicates Fauci. However, if you want to hear about this, you need to join me on Locals. This is for Locals VIPs only. So join us, please, at lizwheelershow.com slash locals. lizwheelershow.com slash locals to hear about this crazy COVID study that obliterates the left's narratives on COVID. If you want to see the rest of this segment, hear everything that we're going to talk about, head on over to Locals, the Liz Wheeler Show community at lizwheelershow.com slash locals. See you there. And on that note, the great and powerful Jay Hay says we are once again out of time for today. We will have to continue where we left off tomorrow. 
In the meantime, think for yourself, use critical thought, question authority, follow the facts, and do not let government or corporate wokeism or anybody bully you into being a sheep. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating. Write us a review. We do read them all. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of Photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Assistant editor, Michael Wall. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Post-production manager, Victoria Metzel. Director of Marketing, Emily Washler. Production and talent coordinator, Matt Toffler. Senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. And production assistant, Mickey Pisani. This has been a Soundfront production.